Hello, and welcome to Cats Week. I'm Annalise Poorman. At the Bloomington Board of Zoning Appeals meeting on April 21st, Planning Development and Services Management Director Jackie Scanlon presented a petition for a sidewalk variance on a property located at 935 West 7th Street. Scanlon shared that the petitioners were informed of the sidewalk standards when they were building the house and that it was included in their site plans. When we realized um, going through our records that the sidewalk that was agreed upon here and required by code was not built, um, we contacted the petitioner with a notice of violation uh, that they had violated their certificate of zoning compliance and um, that their occupancy uh, um, is contingent upon meeting those requirements and one of the requirements is for a new home to build sidewalk, um, in which the petitioner does know. We have extensive um, emails with former staff um, going, uh, discussing the requirements for this property. Um, <clears throat> so then the petitioner decided to request the variance uh, as opposed to building. Scanlon said that the city staff visited the site and deemed that it would be feasible to include a sidewalk. Scanlon shared why this property having a sidewalk is important for the future of sidewalk connectivity in the area. There are no sidewalks immediately to the south. Uh, there are multiple properties. Were those to develop in the future, if there's no sidewalk here, then no sidewalk will be required there because the way that the sidewalk requirement works, uh, you only have to put in the sidewalk for new single family if you are immediately adjacent to existing sidewalk. That's a change we made in, oh gosh, 2017 or 2018 um, because uh, uh, people's concern about having to put in sidewalks for single family that we're never going to connect. So we worked um, with members of the public and the council and changed the regulations to what they are now, which is only if you're part of an existing uh, network, then you need to extend the network. So that's the case here as well. The petitioner, Patrick McAleer, presented to the board explaining why they are requesting the variance. I'd like to provide some background on how we got here in the first place and then provide support based on previous and current UDOs and the transportation plan on why we disagree uh, respectfully uh, and believe the variance should be granted. Uh, we'd like to briefly discuss some of the environmental effects of being forced to construct a sidewalk on, an, on a portion of North Elm between 6th and 7th and discuss the negative impacts on our neighbors and our neighborhood. Lastly, I'd like lastly, I think it's most important to hear from our neighbors in attendance and possibly on Zoom. So first, some background. In 2019, I put an offer on to purchase the lot at 935 West 7th that had been vacant for at least 25 years. I met with the city, Amelia, who was assigned to my permit, and she was delightful. I was immediately told I didn't have to put in a sidewalk. So I started in on the closing process. Maybe a week later, I saw Amelia at the Grand Falloon concert where she was volunteering. We chatted a little bit, and she told me that she might have bad news about the sidewalk and that she was leaving the city. Then I was assigned to my next city planner, Ryan. Ryan informed me I would have to construct a sidewalk to receive a permit. He relayed the message for the city three different times in three different ways. First, he confirmed I would need to build a curb, a five, have a five foot green space, and then a five foot sidewalk, like you might see in any new development in Bloomington, which with setbacks wouldn't allow me to build a house wide enough to fit the historical aesthetic of the neighborhood. The width of our lot is only I thought it was 48, it's actually 46 feet from the last little thing. Then, so after I went back to them and told them that, then he changed his mind, or the city changed their mind to a five foot monolithic curb and sidewalk. Then they came back to me with their final answer, a six foot monolithic curb and sidewalk. And when I asked why the change, the city's reasoning, and again, he's just relaying this, was to meet the width of the sidewalk at the Banneker Center. I was a little bit of disbelief and frankly, I knew nothing about the variance process or UDOs at this point, but Ryan said I could apply for a variance in the future based on the upcoming version of the 2020 UDO that was in progress or final stages. The board voted to postpone their decision on the sidewalk variance to consult with the city staff again. The next meeting will be held on May 26th. 
On April 21st, at the Monroe County Women's Commission meeting, Chair Nichelle Whitney Wash explained to the new commissioners that the commission needs to fill more seats. There are only four seats filled out of the 11 available. Whitney Wash asked County Legal Molly Turner King if the commission would be able to conduct official business with their current numbers. Turner King answered, I don't think so, because I don't think you have a quorum. Um, so I, I think you can have a discussion, but I don't think it qualifies as a meeting. Commissioner Susan Hingle asked about how much time being a part of the commission is. Whitney Wash said that they should be prepared to commit two hours a month at a minimum, one hour for the monthly meeting and one hour of working on projects for the commission, and said that what she hopes to find in future commission members. What type of commissioners are we looking for? I really am looking for people who are committed to doing work. So we're a working commission. We haven't always been seen that way. We kind of were dormant a little bit under radar for a while. Um, this is prior to me being on the commission. So since I've joined, we've really changed our reputation in the community. We're engaged, we partner with other people. So I'm looking for people that actually want to do work not that um, just want to fill resume spots or use this as a launch pad for something else, right? Now, obviously, if this does become a launch pad for something else, that's great. Like we endorse, we support, we will help people get to where they wanna go. But I'm specifically looking for people who want to do work. I'm also interested in people who, um, so not just do work internally, but who want to build relationships with other organizations and entities. So thinking about, okay, if we know that child care is an issue here in Monroe County, who's willing to go and connect with providers in the community to say like, what is it that you all need? How can the Women's Commission help? Does that mean we come in on a Saturday and host a reading day? Does that mean we do um, daycare breaks where we come in and volunteer like hands-on and in, in under-resourced daycares. Like I want people who want to go out into the community and build relationships and position the commission as the support, right? Um, and then the other thing is I want people who are equity-minded. So I don't want a mean girls club or a clicky group. Um, we serve all women, all women, period, right? So I want people who have that mindset to be inclusive, to think about, okay, how do we make sure that policies aren't harming people? How do we conduct our meeting? Is it a way that, so for example, our meetings used to be Fridays at 12 o'clock. Some people don't have the ability to access that type of meeting. Not everyone has the privilege of leaving work to come for a one hour meeting, right? Um, and not everyone has the ability to take this meeting from their workplace. So that's part of the reason why we moved it to an evening after kids are, you know, out of school. My son is here with me today. So you got to bring your kids. You can bring your kids, right? We want people to be able to get to the meeting. So we want equity-minded, equity-centered people who are um, willing to build partnerships across the community and who are ready to work. That's what I'm looking for. Anything else? Titles, accolades, experience? I don't care. If you're willing to work, we can work with that. The next Women's Commission meeting will be held on May 19th. And we'll have more Cats Week after this message. For hurting families in Monroe County. A contribution to, to children who are vulnerable and in need of an advocate. A staff that goes above and beyond to support and advocate for children in need of services. The web of remarkable people who are dealing with difficult situations. So many young people that uh, are in need of help and trying to find a stable family, a stable place to live. Without uh, the CASAs to, to make that happen, many of them would be unable to find a good home. I love being that voice for the child who can't speak for themselves in court. It takes me out of my comfort zone and it also helps others CASA means supporting our community. Being a CASA is making sure that your village is healthy and whole and that the children in your village will someday be able to help the village as well. A child who doesn't have a voice, maybe in their family situation or a school situation, now has a voice that can advocate for them. 
I really enjoy working with children that are going through difficult times and letting them know that I care about their future. We are privileged with our charge of representing the best interest of children. And so therefore we can advocate for exactly what they need without restriction, focusing on their best interest. I want to repair the world one child at a time. Welcome back to Cats Week. During public comment at the Bloomington City Council meeting on April 20th, resident Greg Alexander shared his concerns about apartment complexes that are being proposed isolated from the neighborhoods and without access to sidewalks and public transportation. I'm here to tell you this because I could tell I was really disappointed. Planning staff straight up said there's nothing we can do about this. And, and that's not true, but I can feel their defeat. There is nothing you can do about it without eminent domain, without public will to connect neighborhoods at the cost of a few people's backyards. And it will cost that. And there's no choice about that. If we don't use eminent domain in that way, we will continue to build 160 units of segregated housing that isn't connected to its neighbors. Uh, thanks for your time. Bloomington resident Cheryl Walter asked the council to add a four-way stop to the intersection between Sheridan and Maxwell that she said is unsafe due to the increase in the volume of traffic and the speed on the road. Council members Piedmont Smith, Flaherty, Rollo, and Rosenbarger sponsored a resolution to support the Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition. Council member Isabel Piedmont Smith presented the resolution. For example, the coalition points out that for six years between 2014 and 2020, the vast majority of graduate employees at Indiana University did not receive a raise, while graduate student fees, especially those levied upon international graduate workers, have continued to increase. To this day, many graduate student academic appointees do not earn sufficient compensation to pay living expenses. And whereas, after repeated attempts to increase stipends and reduce fees have failed, the IGWC-UE has pursued unionization of graduate student employees at Indiana University following the university's human resources policy on conditions for cooperation between employee organizations and the administration of IU. And whereas, through the IGWC-UE's efforts organizing efforts, more than 1,750 of approximately 2,500 IU graduate workers have signed union cards indicating they want to be represented by the union, which represents a supermajority of the intended bargaining unit. And whereas the provost of the Indiana University Bloomington campus, Rahul Srivastav, and the president of Indiana University, Pamela Witten, have refused to recognize the Graduate Workers Union or negotiate with IGWC-UE to try to address their concerns, refusing to recognize graduate workers within their existing HR policy on employee organizations. The council voted unanimously in support of the graduate workers. The next city council meeting will be held on May 4th. On April 20th at the Monroe County Public Library Board of Trustees meeting, members heard from Dr. Kintro about the HealthNet Homeless Initiative. The HealthNet staff asked to host clinics at the public libraries. He said that they would like to start a clinic at one site as a pilot program and expand from there. I think um, we need to do a needs assessment and to look at the demand. So what we traditionally have done is we will start um, smaller like we're doing now with one branch and we'll assess the need and from there um, as uh, demand dictates if we can expand we absolutely would love to do that um, is that something we can commit to right now um, yes and no no in the sense that we don't know um, what our demand will be with the initial uh, what I would call pilot um, site but yes in a sense as if there is a need we will do the best that we can within our power and within the resources available to us to meet those needs. HealthNet nurse practitioner Abby Wands clarified how the clinic would operate. If we have a partnership with the library, um, we will have a set time at which we would get there and be there, whether it's every other Wednesday or, you know, we'd have set dates that could certainly be made public. Um, so that way we can 
make sure we're there when we say that we're going to be and, and address that need. You know, there's, there's a lot of chronic health needs in this population. And so while maybe they're concerned about like something acute going on, we're also going to look at the whole person and look at, you know, whether you know their chronic their high blood pressure that may be causing some of their issues and maybe start them on blood pressure medication um now as for like referral and stuff if they we're kind of trying to work through that and where do they go for certain things and um we're, we're still getting all that figured out because again we are primarily based out of indianapolis and so bloomington is new to us um, but then we also may try to get them hooked up with a primary care provider, whether that's with HealthNet or IU Health or wherever it may be, so that way their chronic health needs can continue to be met um, it, even when they're no longer homeless, hopefully. Social worker Melissa Virgis explained why they chose to meet the community at libraries. We know public libraries are a safe space for folks to go, very low barrier. Um, and so look, when I started looking at the library, you know, in Indianapolis, we have a great relationship with them as well. We've never had a clinic, um, but I was thinking, where can we have a clinic for folks that don't go to shelter that, you know, maybe we can't even really catch on the streets because they're, they maybe are not an established camp or something like that. And we know that the library is again, a really safe space for folks to go. So crazy idea, but I was like, maybe we could have a clinic at the library because we know people come there, they feel safe, they feel welcomed, um, and it's very low barrier to access, you know, any to access services. So um, that's really what what my goal was in looking at the library. Virgis also said that they are in contact with the Shalom Center and Wheeler Mission so that they are not providing overlapping services. Board member Nichelle Whitney Wash asked if the patients being referred to other practices would be guaranteed assistance due to the current lack of health care available. Dr. Kintro said that they will keep working with a patient until they are able to get help from medical specialists. He also said that they are able to use their connections with HealthNet to call in favors if patients need urgent help. The board will hear from them again before they are asked to vote on the partnership. The next Board of Trustees meeting will be held on May 18th. And we'll have more Cats Week after this message. I'm at risk of thinking there's just no point in trying. risk of looking in the mirror and hating what I see. I'm at risk of regretting what I do just to join the crowd. I'm at risk of being told not to tell. And you would never know it by looking at me. But with Girls Inc. in my corner, there for me every day. Believing in me. Showing me what's possible. I can be strong enough to respect myself and my body. To say I can rather than I can't. To say no with no apology. To be a leader. To finish school. To own my future. To break the cycle. Girls Inc. believes every girl can succeed. That's why the trained professionals of Girls Inc. are there for our girls every day, supporting, mentoring, and guiding them in a safe, girls-only environment, building bonds that last for years and change that lasts a lifetime. Girls Inc. gives girls the tools they need to boldly face challenges, to resist peer pressure, to be the first in their families to go to college, to beat the odds. With Girls Inc. in her corner, every girl can be healthy, confident, and resilient. She'll do more than dream about her potential. She'll reach it.
With you in my corner. With you in my corner? I will not be another statistic. I will fight for myself. For my future. With you in my corner, I will win. Fuel her fire and she will change the world. Girls Inc. Inspiring all girls to be strong, smart, and bold. Welcome back to Cats Week. At the Monroe County Commissioner's meeting on April 20th, Health Department Director Penny Cottle gave an update on vaccine status. What does it mean to be partially vaccinated? Uh, you've had one shot perhaps of a two dose mRNA vaccine, but you haven't completed it. Are you fully vaccinated? You've had one dose of Johnson & Johnson or two doses of Pfizer or Moderna, and then are you up to date? So you've been fully vaccinated and you have had your re recommended boosters. Greg Crone explained that the demand for steel is high right now, so the desks that they are scrapping could bring in $50 to $60 each. Cottle asked the board to approve a rental agreement with Storage Express. She shared that they have extra supplies from COVID-19 clinics and want to use the Storage Express facilities to store them until the equipment is needed if there is another surge. We have a lot of PPE and things that we, from our testing sites and uh, vaccine clinics that we need a place to store safely uh, for a period of time. And in terms of planning for what happens if we have another surge, that kind of thing, we wanna make sure that we have some supplies already handy and that we don't have to scurry to try to find those. So uh, this is really just to provide adequate safe temperature controlled storage for us that we have easy access to. And so the, again, I think legal for looking over the, the agreement and it is ready to go if you approve it. The commissioners approved the agreement unanimously. The next meeting will be held on April 27th. At the Bloomington Redevelopment Commission meeting on April 18th, Director of Housing and Neighborhood Development John Zodi shared that Commission member David Walter passed away. I do have one less roll call uh, this meeting and uh, David Walter, uh, as, as all of you know, uh, passed away over the uh, last weekend uh, on April 10th. And so just want to make sure we acknowledge that publicly and remember David and his services are this weekend on Saturday here in Bloomington at 2 o'clock at the funeral chapel on East 3rd there by uh, the mall. So just want to uh, remember David and certainly serve the city for a long time in this commission. Um, heard a proclamation from the mayor uh, on April 4th and so just want to take take note of that and uh, that we will miss David and um, uh, not suffering anymore. I think it came faster than uh, a lot of us thought and I know a lot of you knew David a lot longer than, than I did. Um, but certainly a great guy that we'll, we'll miss. Economic and Sustainable Development Director Alex Crowley noted that the drone show at the mill was a successful event. You'd given a uh, right of entry to uh, the Combine to do a drone show. And for those of you who were able to get out there and see it, it was really cool. The, uh, first of all, the Combine was very successful this year. And uh, as you know, that's a longstanding program in Bloomington. Uh, it was at the mill. And I went to an afternoon session. It was really good. Uh, but this drone show was, was particularly fun and different. And I, I think it's the first time we've done it in Bloomington. So thank you for, for allowing them to do that. And I think it was a, a big success. Neighborhood Services Program Manager Angela Van Roy presented on the Neighborhood Improvement Grant Program. Van Roy said that HAND received three applications for this funding round in 2022. The HAND a Neighborhood Improvement Grant Program received three applications for this funding round in 2022. Uh, five member council was convened to review applications. These members are Roy Ayton from the Engineering Department here with the city, Nate Nickel from Public Works, Deborah Meyerson, a member of the RDC, Sue Tui, a member of the Crescent Bend Neighborhood Association, and Linda Woods, a member of the Eastern Heights Neighborhood Association. On Monday, April 11th, the council convened in a public meeting to hear applicant presentations. And on Wednesday, April 13th, the council members met to discuss projects and vote on funding rec recommendations, again, in a public meeting. Uh, by unanimous vote, the following neighborhood 
projects are recommended to the RDC for funding. She shared the applications they recommended to receive the grant funding were for Arden Place Neighborhood Association, the Blue Ridge Neighborhood Association, and the Prospect Hill Neighborhood Association. Commission member Randy Cassidy asked if the outdoor fitness equipment the Arden Place Neighborhood Association wants to install would need to be maintained by the City Parks Department and if the cost of that was calculated into the grant amounts. Van Roy responded. To yeah, the, the parks, so we don't get decoration. The parks, those, um, that equipment will belong to the parks. Okay. So all of those are installed by the Parks Department. Um, the one in particular, Arden Place, with the fitness equipment, mm -hmm. the actual fitness equipment that will go there has not yet been determined. That's going to be happening along with parks and a okay. committee of two different neighborhoods that will come together mm -hmm. to determine exactly what they want to put there. So that one we funded at a to at no more than 9000 We're not quite sure exactly what it the exact number will be. The commissioners voted unanimously to approve the distribution of the neighborhood improvement grants. The next meeting will be held on May 2nd. And that is all for Cats Week. Thank you for joining us. For Cats and WFHB, I'm Annalise Poorman.